Well, hello and welcome to another week of the Dividend Cafe. I am excited to be near the end of the week. I don't even really know what week. It, I guess it's still first week in November. It's been a whirlwind and uh, we have plenty to go here in November. It was a busy week in markets and, and I've written a lot about that each day in DC Today, the, the week's activity with the Fed and with uh, earnings season, with the election, with uh, whatever the, the House is about to do. I, I don't I guess I'll interject and talk about the stuff I said I wasn't going to talk about. Um, I don't think what the House is going to do or not do in the next couple of days really matters much at all because everyone is clearly aware that it then has to go to the Senate and and whatever the House does is not what's going to come out of the Senate. Whether anything comes out of the Senate or something different, it, it's going to be different. And so... You know, from the policy standpoint to Fed to earnings, it, it, this was one of those weeks you had a little bit of everything. And um, I chose to focus this week on the subject of debt. And yet it isn't really about the debt. Um, I talk about the debt a lot. And yet this week I want to kind of make a point as to why our focus on the Fed is so connected to debt and why our focus on health and the corporate economy is so connected to the Fed. And so that there is sort of a little rhyme and reason to how, how these things all play together, okay? Um, the, the easiest part to understand is that uh, the government has spent a lot of money in recent years, and I guess some people may not know exactly when it all began and when the percentages of debt level debt to grow uh, to GDP growth started to go higher. You know, the history of all of it is stuff I may study a lot and it may not be very important to a lot of you. But, you know, most people know that the national debt has blown out uh, since COVID. And, and, and because we've had these like huge headline spending bills, it's a little bit more front and center. And I suppose somewhat less people, but still a lot of people know so that trend actually had begun before COVID, that out of the financial crisis, we began uh, really increasing the level of debt, while at the same time decreasing the growth of the denominator, which was the, the economy, the GDP growth. So we were growing debt faster than we were growing the economy, and the economic growth um, really slowed post-crisis, and then the COVID moments have created all that complexity, uh, but, you know, that the period of really high government spending did start even before the financial crisis. I go through this history, by the way, because I want to be a, as clear as anyone is willing to allow me to be and take me at my word that this is not a political comment for me. I could make the argument that a, a real big portion of the criticism, if I were making political criticism here, would be targeted at the party I happen to have been registered in for my whole voting life. And so this is not um, about present policy prescription exclusively. And, and it isn't about, um, you know, left wing, right wing. This is through two Republican presidents and through two Democrat presidents in the last 20 years. I can go further back as well, but there's different dynamics that would be at play. We have had an explosion in national debt. And now this week, you have a week where we're, we're really focused on the Fed. And there's a lot of wondering right now how healthy the corporate sector is. And I think my point is that none of these things are as disconnected as people believe. So you go back to um, the controversies that have played out about what the Fed's doing. You know, are they being sensitive enough to inflation? Um, are they trying hard enough to get full employment? Those are the two, you know stated mandates of the Fed, price stability and full employment, maximum employment. I think that there's just no way to come out and say what everybody has to know to be true in the most apolitical sense possible, that the Fed also knows it carries the burden of facilitating the governmental spending. The Fed doesn't get a vote in what the government spends money on Neither really does the Treasury Department, although they get they're an executive part of the executive branch of government, they get to influence what the legislator does. Technically speaking, the, the pen of the president can veto 
And so the Treasury is under that executive branch. But as a matter of law, what gets spent in our country is a byproduct of what the legislator does. And our legislator is bicameral across the House of Representatives and the United States Senate. And we have a process by which bills become law and laws create spending and spending is then um, the responsibility of the Treasury Department to, to administer. So the Treasury um, has to raise debt to pay for what they are doing. And the fact of the matter is that the Fed cannot um, allow an environment where the Treasury is unable to finance the debts that they've taken on. The, the Fed has become burdened with being an accomplice to the activity of Treasury and the legislator. And I do know what the argument is. The Fed critics can say, no, the Fed can stand up to them and say, we're not going to do it. So you guys can go figure out yourself how you're going to spend this money. But we're not going to help with interest rates or with bond purchases to facilitate the madness. So I guess you guys are just going to have to go spend less money. And that's the point of an independent central bank. And I get it. And there is a pretty high amount of truth to the argument in theory. But in practice, the Fed's burdened with full employment. And you can't have full employment with 10% inflation, uh, with 10% interest rates. And the Fed has taken it, on, taken it on themselves to be a arbiter of the business cycle. And so therefore, the Fed is has, has operated as if they believe the path to least resistance is to facilitate government spending so as to allow these engines to keep churning. Well... The reality I would offer to you is that while it has plugged some holes and band-aided some otherwise tricky economic realities, that it's, it's catching up because the marginal revenue product of the debt, it's a dollar of GDP growth you get for every dollar of debt you add, has collapsed. So by facilitating increasing government spending, it's no longer creating the, the sustenance of economic growth that's been needed to keep the whole thing going, which plays into price stability, which plays into maximum employment. And so now all of a sudden, the, the, the tools that were used to create the problem, um, that, excuse me, to treat the problem, are now adding to the problem. Because you've gotten this decline in the, uh, it's a diminishing return, effectively, of the debt. And, you know, it's, a, it's appropriate to have um, a social or a political conversation about what is the appropriate level of debt, whether it's a company, whether it's a, a household, whether it's a government. Um, there are social objectives sometimes to debt, you know, wh what kind of social safety net we want to have in the country, how we want to pay for it. There are matters of national defense that are not productive in a business sense, but they're necessary to the legitimate function of government to protect our country. And then, of course, there are um, these Keynesian arguments for government spending in the aggregate, uh, helping to stimulate aggregate demand. And that is, I guess, the area in which no one seems to be arguing that anymore. No one seems to be saying that increasing transfer payments are necessary to, to stimulate the economy. Uh, that word stimulus was very common coming out of the financial crisis. And you recall President Obama famously passed under the direction of economic advisor Larry Summers a stimulus project. And, and a lot of people, candidly, I was one of them, were critical of that package, not believing it to be as effective as promised. But regardless, that was the stated intent. That's not really the stated intent now. We now talk about social objectives for good or for bad, transfer uh, uh, programs for good or for bad, transfer payments. And, and so that redistributionism does become less productive in terms of what it does into the debt, uh, the use of debt towards the economic growth in our society. So the Fed has to bear the burden of this, and the Fed isn't the one creating it, but of course they're facilitating it, but that's you know, I, I, I don't have an argument as to what they should do or shouldn't do for our purposes now. I have an argument as to what investors should do and shouldn't do. In a perfect world, I would say, okay, 
um, governments are not in a position to add to aggregate demand right now. Uh, governments are not in a position to stimulate productive growth. Governments have spent and indebted themselves into a corner where marginal revenue product on the debt has really declined. But you know what? That's where corporate America has to step up. They'll re-lever. They'll take on more debt, more expenditure to get more growth, to get more productivity and kind of offset where the government, they'll fill in where the government can't. And, and, and I think that you got a lot of re-levering of corporate America post-financial crisis. And that a lot of the delevering that took place that always takes place out of a recession, that's what a recession is effectively, is, uh, is, is companies lowering their investment, lowering their borrowing, lowering their output in response to an anticipation of declining economic um, growth. And yet, to be very candid, that played out. And it generated more jobs, it generated more tax revenue, but the government debt and, and deficits exploded because the um, output we were getting from corporate America was not able to keep up with the, the growth in the size of spending and government and indebtedness, okay? So what happened? Um, you, you've re-levered corporate America, but you can re-lever corporate America from a delevered position. You can't re-lever corporate America from an already re-levered position. And this is why the debt levels of corporate America matter to me. Because even though I think many of them are healthy ratios, are very affordable, in some cases they're zombie companies that have re-levered and take advantage of low rates to keep the wheels turning of what is otherwise a dead, defunct, and kaput business. But for the most part, there's been a lot of productive use of debt in the last 10 to 13 years in our economy. But they already went from three times debt to income to five times. They can't go further. And so we can't look to the deficiency that exists and say, well, let's get, let's get that made up for out of the corporate sector when the corporate sector has already given it its best shot. And, and here we are. So now the Fed has to keep rates low to keep businesses borrowing and obviously keep the government borrowing. And I don't think you're ever going to hear any Fed governor say, yeah, we have to be hyper accommodative because we're trying to help the government borrow money. Now, we have to be hyper accommodative because to whatever degree we can get any output, it's got to come from a continued attempt at leverage in the corporate sector. They can't say it, but I can say it. And, and I don't think it's remotely controversial. And yet that does tell us that there is downward pressure on yields. And unfortunately, for all the reasons I've talked about, downward pressure on growth expectations. The growth levels necessary to grow our way to get output uh, out of this is, um, is, is utterly incomprehensible at this point in time. So I don't, I don't want to talk about what the policy prescriptions ought to be. I mean, I guess I do want to talk about it, but not, not right here. What I think it means to investors is this ongoing understanding that there's a lot more that goes on than what you hear talked about regarding the dual mandate and why when they say, oh, well, uh, inflation's picked up around these supply shocks, so the Fed might have to really see rates go higher. I would just suggest that the Fed has more going on than just where they see price levels, price stability, let alone the employment number. The employment number thing is what's got to be talked about, but they can move that all they want. We saw that. Ben Bernanke had said back... I think it was 2010, we want to get to 6% unemployment, and then it got to 6, and he said 5, and then it got to 5, and he said 4. And then he was long gone out of the Fed before they ever started raising rates higher. Um, the unemployment target can become a very moving target. And, there, and I think that ultimately, whether you look at price levels, price stability, inflation, all these factors, apart from a conversation about causation, which is another topic I've addressed heavily this year, but the fact of the matter is that the Fed has other things going on in their now assumed role as the administrator of the business cycle, the smoother of the business cycle, if you will, and then their facilitator of government obligation. That is a tricky couple hats to ask the Fed to wear. And that is the environment for investing in which we manage. And I hope this has been helpful and useful to you here in the Dividend Cafe. Um, Thank you for listening to and watching the Dividend Cafe. 
Give us some reviews, forward to your friends, blah, blah, blah. Have a wonderful weekend.